got a favorite Laker? I love Kobe Bryant because I want him to have sex with me. Woo! It's good! Oh my God! Well, you know, you always give me a hard time. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't ever give me the credit that I really deserve. You're good at commentating, so stick to commentating. Let me do the fight. Here we go! Welcome, everyone, to Cooper and Rupert Podcast. It's Mikey Rupert along with Doug Cooper. Thank you very much for listening. I really want to state that. I haven't overstated it enough. Thank you very much for clicking. Thank you very much for listening. We do this for you. Sports happen, and that's what we're here for. We appreciate all of you and your time. We know it's valuable. Of course. And you're wasting it with us. Exactly. Is that sweet? That sounded sweet. It is. So thank you very much. Thanks for telling everyone about uh, our podcast. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's we, cool. We have some sports for you today, as we always do, because this is a sports podcast. And we have nothing else to talk about. When there's no sports happening, you and I just sit in a quiet room. Yes, that's exactly what we it. do. And we look at the walls. <laughs> don't say a word. Today on the program, I've got a really interesting stat about, uh, about um, popularity in sports. Okay. Um, and and it, among, amongst the kids these days. Oh, the youth. The, the youth. We're going to talk, of course, college hoops. We've, uh, we're going to talk some uniform talk today. Unis. We're even going to have, a, we're even gonna have some uh, talk about baseball. And we have a new segment that we want to introduce. Two new segments yeah. on the program today. We do. We have two new segments that we want to go into. One of them you may already know. Um, and uh, the other one we'll introduce for the first time later in the show. And it'll surely be a disaster. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward sure to it. I'm sure it will. No, it'll be great. It's, yeah, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a good time. I'm looking forward to lots of uh, kind of silly stuff today on the program. But the first thing that I want to get to on today, the, the show today, is this stat that, that, I, that my brother drew, uh, brought attention to me. It's um, it, it ESPN's the Sports Poll Annual Report. They uh, interview... 1500 Americans a month for about a year and they poll uh, the, the demographics on what sports they are quote avid inter- avidly interested in mm-hmm. um, the the segment that they targeted this time was 12 to 17 year olds the kids the kids these days what's going and on and I guess they asked little Timmy what he liked in sports and the one thing that's a little unclear about this por- uh, poll is I don't know if they had if they could choose multiple sports. That's yeah. the one thing that I wasn't sure of. But what they came up with, I guess just t- testing random youth, is that um, the, the, the big surprise on the list is that the Major League Soccer is now more popular amongst this demographic than Major League Baseball. Yeah. Obviously, that is, that's brand new. I mean, this, this stat, uh, it, it just came out. And it and it's I've got a nice line graph here going back <laughs> to 1995 nice on on this particular age group and their popularity as uh, pertains year in year out. And soccer's basically had an astronomical rise. They yes, went it from has. Last to second in like one generation. MLS became a league in um, what is it? 95. 96. 95 or 96, yeah. 96, and it's only been going up since, but really, really slowly. It's been, it's been even to the past five, five years ago, MLS wasn't that popular. But I think maybe with this last World Cup, maybe with, you know, kind of David Beckham taking the front, there's a lot of different ways that, it, there's a lot of different things that kind of attributed to this, but, um, but it, MLS has taken a huge spike. David and Beckham it, is beautiful. So that definitely has something to do with it. It probably does. I mean, who wouldn't want to look at it? They him? even talked about the video game, like FIFA. Yeah. It's extremely popular. It's a big game, yeah. And, and that could, you know, has brought an awareness of the sport, I think. In, uh, so kids are more popular, or MLS is, is more popular among this demographic um, than the Major League Baseball, which doesn't mean as much for the here and right now. But, I mean, these kids are going to be growing up here in the next 10 years, and they're going to be the target audience and Major League Soccer is going to have more viewing than Major League Baseball. I mean, it appears. if Because yeah. obviously baseball can go up or down, or MLS can go up or down as well. I, I found, oh, go ahead. I, I just, I found this stat absolutely fascinating, and I, it hurts me, <laughs> but it excites me at the same time. Yeah, because you're a soccer guy too. You love soccer. I love soccer. As a matter of fact, I watched uh, Sporting KC and uh, Seattle Sounders on Saturday. It was the MLS's opening day. Um, I love it. The I, fact I, that you know that, I mean, sp- speaks volumes. I watched I the game. No I streamed it illegally. I barely know what that sentence meant. Yeah. Barely. 
You know, and it's good. I'm into it. I was totally into it when Sporting KC won the MLS Cup, which was a freaking awesome game, by the way. They won in penalty kicks yeah. at the end of the game. I mean, for a championship, it was unbelievable. Um, well, I, I kind of have... This doesn't surprise me as much as it surprised you. And I basically think it's pretty much 99% because of Twitter. I th- th- That's a good point. I, I wanted to finish up what, okay. what I was saying. I, I was just... I've, so I was happy because... I love baseball. That's what I've grown up. Or excuse me. I was saddened because I love baseball mm-hmm. uh, to death. I played it growing up. As I, I mean, before I could hardly walk, I've been playing baseball. I played it till I was 19 years old. I uh, love the Royals. It's just it's been a part of of who I have been growing up. And to see that it's not that's not reciprocating, or is that the right use? Well, to word? see that it's the, not it's the, it's not conne- baseball is not connecting like it did with me. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I just, I hope that baseball is not in danger because it, you know, because the attention spans of like children can't handle a game like baseball. I, I hope that it doesn't mean that it's in danger or that, that we're going to be getting less, lesser players at the same time. I'm also very excited because I'm a huge soccer guy and I love that soccer in this country is getting more popular, which inevitably will translate into the national team. Well, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think, well, a couple of things. Okay. So back to the Twitter thing. I yes, mean, what yes, I mean by that yes. is basically kids want to play sports that they see on TV and they like watching on TV because they have heroes, they have idols, they have stars that they like. And they're, and then, you know, they watch those games. I remember always watching games and then you get excited to go play baseball with your friends. And that's, but at the same time, kids also want to watch what they're playing. Most kids these days play youth soccer. It's just like the first thing you play in most cities, most uh, states around the country, no matter what, it's the first thing you play. And I think nowadays, since kids aren't watching baseball as much, purely because of kind of what you said, like it, it's just, it's a really, really slow game. And kids today, I don't think have the faculties to sit through a four hour baseball game. And so the fact that one of those streets is blocked off now and kids aren't watching baseball as much, I think it's just ultimately going to ding baseball's popularity over the years. And it and might only get worse because baseball doesn't seem to be doing anything to make the game faster. They do or have replay now. Well, they're not. They're not going to do anything to like speed up the game, but they would. But they are adding replay. I think it makes it a little bit more hip. That brings it into the 21st century. Yeah, but I mean that just makes the game longer in some ways. I mean, I, you know, the thing is like, soccer is always happening. It's you watch a game, the game goes the whole time. Yeah, it's no always, commercials. No I do, commercials. I love that about soccer. It can I do keep, love that. Yeah, it can keep your attention. It's faster. I mean, there, there's just a lot more going on, and I think because of that, like kids, they don't want to like watch a guy warm up for a pitching change you it, know spend like 10 minutes on the mound doing something that's not even part of the actual game i i told i get it i see why baseball has has taken a hit in popularity i mean we also have other sports like the nfl which we'll get to they're also on this list and we'll get to those in a minute but the, but the headline is of course the baseball mls thing mm-hmm. but i i get it but it's just sad that it's like that, that we so like busy or can't handle it to watch a baseball game. Some people aren't into it, and I guess I get that. But it, it, not to not to this point. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, and, and for me, dude, honestly, like I, I remember when the Rangers in the World Series. That was like probably the first time I'd actually sat down and watched a game all the way through on TV in like a long time. And those games were like four hours, four and a half hours long. That's the World Series that I can barely get through. I was just like, oh my God, like I almost want the Rangers to lose so I don't have to watch any more of these games. Like this is insane. Like they're just so, it's such a chore. And you can't just like, you can't just pop on a game. Like you pop on a soccer game, it's over in two hours. No, almost indefinitely. That's right. Like almost all the time for sure. Baseball game, I mean, you don't have time to be spending four and a half hours watching a baseball game. Well, most people don't. I mean, I'm just saying, and yeah. kids, and I'm not even part of this younger gener- generation who, you know, uh, like their attention spans are probably lesser than ours. And, and I think, you know, it doesn't help that t- baseball has made no efforts. Like somewhere right now, Bud Selig is getting briefed on like what Twitter is. Like he's just learned about it because I feel like baseball has made no effort to like to reach these kids. They're just like, this is the sport. We can't change it. It's it's like paralyzed by its own tradition. And I think because of that, it, it will suffer. It's possible. I, I think you make all good points. I, I, I did, haven't disagreed with anything that you said. It's just, to me, it's just, it hurts a little bit because I, I'm very passionate about this sport. And I, I don't think that it's going to go away forever. I mean, uh, what is it? 18.4% 
of youth that age said that they're avid baseball fans and the same, but what was it? The, about the exact same said MLS. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's not, I guess that's not terrible. It hasn't really declined that much from the mid nineties. It was at about 27%. So it's gone down a little bit. Um, well, and here's the other thing. I think soccer will increase in popularity as well because with all with all the football stuff, all the concussion stuff, I think parents are just going to say, like, you can't play football. You and can't. That, and, and all those kids, I bet a lot of those kids are going to end up playing soccer. See, and that's the thing, is especially in high schools, it's not like baseball and soccer are competing against each other. Football and soccer are competing against each other. Usually. Baseball is played in the spring, and in high schools, soccer is played in the fall. Excuse me. No, sometimes in the winter. Is soccer played in the spring or is soccer played in the fall? I thought it was in the fall. Sometimes in the winter too. I mean, soccer is year round basically, and then and, and in some ways, so is football. I think, but I think the skill sets yeah. are similar. I think those have the most overlap. And, but as a kid, you can like different sports. That's, yeah, and and that's what I don't. You know, it's like you can like soccer and you can like baseball. You you can like everything. It's not like if you if you enjoy soccer, you can't like baseball. So I don't think the soccer popularity is taking away from baseball. It's just that the soccer population among the kids are growing. They, they dig it more, I guess. Yeah, and if they're getting the best athletes, if, if soccer starts getting all the football athletes and, and we look to soccer as like, here are some of our best athletes in the like because we never look at our soccer team like that. We're like, these guys are secondary athletes. They didn't play one of the real sports. They play soccer. But if those football guys start going to to that world and start playing soccer and we look at these guys and we're like oh my god like this and what it's going to take is basically some superstar freak athlete who's just dominant for for american soccer and when we get one of those guys and we we recognize them being like an elite level talent like athletically who, somebody who could play anything that's when i think you know the popularity for MS could really skyrocket I think you're right. They just need to get a couple more stars. I think that's the one thing that they're lacking is they've got... Because we know that the, 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 the big guys are in Europe. Yeah. But we've got a few more. The, the United States has done a good job of trying to get their homegrown talent back. With like Clint Dempsey yeah. coming back to MLS. I mean, there's a, there are several players that have... From, they're from the national team that they're trying to get back. Um, I think Michael Bradley, he came back. I think he plays for Portland. Oh. Or Toronto. Toronto FC or Portland. Anyways, that, I sounded bad there. Uh, <laughs> but I like that. I kind of like that they're trying to get the United States back uh, back here. And I think that having those big names coming back, I, the MLS will grow. It's going to be more popular, which is inevitably exciting because it's going to take uh, the national team is going to be that much better. And I, honestly, dude, I think like the, the, more the, the more talent we have here and the more we grow our own stars, the more the MLS will take off. Because those guys, I think if, if it came down to it, unless the pay was just je- like enormously different, you know, like oh, I'm going to make four times, five times as much as I, in Europe as I can here. If the pay is comparable, yeah, people from the United States want to play in the United States. I would rather be playing in the United States. I mean, I don't want to go to a new country necessarily. Like, you only do that if because it's the best competition and that's the way you want to test yourself. Yes. Plus, they're the ones who actually pay soccer players. We don't pay them shit over here. That's right. So when that happens, I think it, I think soccer is the future. Soccer yeah. and NBA, I think, is gonna where it's gonna be at in like twenty years. I think that's that's interesting. Uh, the rest of the poll of the results um, topped it out thirty eight percent of this. Of this, we're talking the twelve to seventeen year olds still. Thirty eight percent was the NFL. Yeah. Uh, number two is the NBA. Thirty point one percent. Yeah. They've been trending up for the past five years, ten five, years. Five, six years. Yeah. Um, college football kind of had, they, they, they were up and now they're a little bit down. 27.5. That's where they're at. And then it's, the, then it's uh, NCAA hoops at 23.8. And that's what I don't get. College basketball is more popular than, than professional baseball. I think it's just because basketball is so much more, po- like so much more popular. But I mean, that's the thing is like, and if we want to like talk about college basketball here, but I mean like college basketball is a sport that's suffering as well. Yeah, it is. And that's the thing. I think it's mostly kids don't have baseball's hard. It's a tough sport to be satisfactory at. Yeah. There's work that has to be done for you to get at a level to be able to go play. Mo- a lot of these other sports I think are a little bit easier to jump into with good a- with with good athletes. Yeah. So I agree. You've got NCAA basketball 23, and then the 18s tied up, MLS, Major League Soccer, and then all the way at the bottom, 8.8 is the NHL. Yeah, as it always will be. It's a cult following. Yeah. 
you know, every stadium is packed, but no one's watching on television. Well, half the population can't play it. So that's the biggest problem for the NHL. Yeah, it's, like it's difficult. You got to go to a facility. Yeah. You know, it's, it's expensive. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like baseball. I mean, yeah. we obviously see more baseball diamonds than we do hockey ranks, but you know, the sports that are, are tough to access are the, are the ones that are tougher to play. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, speaking of uh, college basketball, I think um, the, our next topic, which is, are we, you yeah, wanna, yeah we're, we're talking a little college hoops here in a bit. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they, like, I, I it's a sport that's trending down, and I think one of the reasons is, is guys like Calipari, who we're, who we've been talking about, you know, like, and who we're about to talk about. But basically, this whole one and done thing, which we talked about last week, is a, is a big, a big problem. I think that's why that sports. I want to talk about Kentucky. They lost on Saturday and likely would be bumped out of the top twenty-five. They're, yeah, they're not. They're gonna. They're saved. They're saved by their ass because there's no more ranks. For the rest of the year, because we're going to go into conference tournament. You know, the games finished up today. All the mm-hmm. regular season games, our conference tournaments, especially for the little ones, have already wrapped up today. So there's no more ranks because everybody's going to be seated in their conference tournament. And then, of course, the big dance. Yeah. But this new rank would put the number one preseason team out of the top 25. Why is that? I mean, wh- why is wh- like what happened to be preseason ranked number one with the talent that they've got? How do you go from number one to just out of it? I don't know. I think so. Cal- Calipari is just such a salesman. I think I feel like you hate this guy. I do. Okay, I, okay, everything's negative. He is a scumbag. Okay, all right. Well, well, let's talk about it. All right. So part of it, I think, is just Calipari is good at selling these teams. He always has the best recruiting class, and he's always talking to scouts and AAU guys. And he, I feel like he manipulates the system to kind of, uh, you know, his draft classes are always hyped. No, wait a minute. Are you saying that, that Kentucky is overrated because Calipari is good with the media? I think that's part of it. I really do. And I think he's good at hyping his own guys. I don't know about that, man. I think you're drinking the Kool-Aid because these guys... They're, they're nationally ranked by rivals or whoever, and Kentucky's the team that's getting them. I know, but he's following these guys all the way up. He knows who his guys are. He's going through AAU. He's, a, he's an AAU dude. He's like tied into that world so heavily. I think he's good at promoting the guys he gets, and he's good at selling them. And so it's a two-way street for them as well. It's like, you know, they're going, coming to Kentucky because they know he'll sell the shit out of them. He'll help them with their draft stock. He'll help them coming in. He'll help, help them going out. And, 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 you know, in return, they, he gets these number one draft classes, six of the top 10, six of the top 15, the greatest team ever, as he said this year. Basically, you know, talking about how he was dancing on the way to work every day because he got this, these six alpha male dudes who were like his best recruiting class ever, which alone by itself is kind of crazy because he's had some really good players. Yeah, but he's won a national title doing that exact method. He has, but he's also had a lot of teams that are bust. And I think this whole one and done thing, you know, like the, just his style of recruiting, it, it makes it hard for, for teams to gel. And, and, and I think expectations are maybe sometimes unnaturally high for a team with five guys who have never played together. Before. I think that's a good point. And there are more than one ways to skin a cat, as we saw last year with Rick Pitino in Louisville. That yeah. team was mostly built around older players that had stayed there. Yeah. You can win either way. Calipari's way is to get these young guys that are going to be the one and done and try to just keep them in a pin for long enough and, and get this team mentality, which is difficult, but if there's anybody who can handle those kind of egos, he's the best at it. But as we're seeing right now, it's just not working. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think... He, you know, yeah, there's something to be said for having the best players and that you have the superstar team. But like, as you were saying with Louisville, like systems matter, role players are important, senior leadership, these kind of things do matter as well. And I think a team of superstars coming out of high high school superstars isn't always the best thing to have. I agree. But the thing that's annoying to me about him, especially this season, is just the way he's just taken a dive on his team. And, and and he recruited these guys. He hyped them up. He put the expectations on their shoulders. And now that they actually need him to back them up and be like, these guys are good. They're going through a hard time right now, but I got their back. He's dipping out on press conferences. He's blaming, he's throwing his players under the bus. And, and he's just like, like, I just think he's such a shady scumbag. Nothing is ever his fault. He's always the guy who's like, you know, he's that guy. He's that bro. He's like, 
He's the guy you could blame him for anything. He, you just saw him do it, and he would figure out a way to justify the fact that that wasn't his fault. That somebody put him in that scenario where he. I had think you're to do blinded this. by rage. That's what I think. I think you are upset at this guy. You've got it personal because I don't think that there's anything wrong with holding players accountable. Now I don't either, but it's the way he does it. It's the way he says it's not my fault. The players won't do what I say. So he just throws them under the bus. You know, Harrison's not running the point correctly. It's his fault. He did it last year to Archie Goodwin. He ran him out of town. He tra- had to transfer. He's like, this kid isn't doing what I tell him to, and that's why the team's bad. It's not my fault. It's this 18-year-old kid who I hyped up as the greatest thing ever, and now he's not doing exactly what I want, and I'm not winning a national title. So fuck this kid. I'm saving my own ass. And I just think that's scummy. Not to mention, just historically, it, it, it pisses me off that Calipari was able to go to UMass, get a bunch of recruiting violations, and bounce to the NBA, take another paycheck while UMass had to eat shit, and then go to Miss, uh, uh, and then go to well, Memphis. Yeah, Pete Carroll did that to USC. I mean, we see I it know. all the time. Guys I hate dip it. Out. Yeah, I think it's, it's so weak. Like, and then he, do, he went, did the same thing to Memphis, and now he's in Kentucky just blaming these kids that he probably recruited illegally. Like, he's just a shady... You Dude. are so over the top right now. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Did I just go? Did I just you... go talk radio on that? I don't know. I guess now. Hey, hey man, it's your take. I'm I just, not. I just. I just think that you're you're blinded. I just think it's unfair for him to heap so much expectations on these kids because he's the one doing all the talking about how they're gonna. They were gonna go forty and zero, and he was handing out shirts that said forty and zero and all this stuff. And and then and then when they actually need him to support support him, he's not even going to the press conferences. He sent out his assistant coach. And two kids who are 18 years old to do the press conference because he didn't want to deal with it. And he's the one who threw the temper tantrum. Well, <laughs> they, did, they did lose to an RPI like 178. Yeah. And that's got to be on him because, too, right? I, well, you're probably right. I'm just saying it was Calipari coached them at a 178 degree level. I mean, is that why they're... He's the architect of all this nonsense. No, you're right. He's the ultimate to blame. I mean, you got to blame the guy at the top, right? These are his boys. He got exactly who he wanted. He's the coach. I mean, at some point, it's just like he has to be like, I don't, I just don't understand why he's like, I didn't do a good enough job. He just refuses to say that. He's always like, uh, this, this kid, this 17 year old over here. Well, he may have a point. <laughs> Maybe. If they were, if they were all that good and he's a coach that's won titles, the independent variable here is. The players aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or maybe it's Anthony Davis. Or maybe the unibrow. Maybe the brow is that powerful. It's it's coming back. Having having Anthony Davis and Michael Kidd Gilchrist doesn't hurt. The one thing that I think is hilarious about about uh, Anthony Davis's unibrow is, of course, people he knows about it. He must yeah. just like it. Oh, he owns it. Yeah, he, he trademarked uni- he yeah. trademarked unibrow I think or the brow. Great. You can trademark a unibrow. I guess I don't even know what that means. What's so if some like little seventeen-year-old kid, uh, you know, working on his computer or playing World of Warcraft, he can sue them for having unibrow? Or no, no, not like. What do you mean? Not like he can walk around the street pointing to people with unibrows and going, "Give me Sued. money." <laughs> yeah, no, no, tweezers or you owe me a million dollars. <laughs> it's not like that, but it's like I think if somebody put a shirt with him on it that said the brow, like he would have to get paid for that. Okay, I can see the brow. Yeah, like that's his nickname okay. or something. I don't know. But, I mean, I think he had a lot to do with it. More than I would say almost more than Calipari. Because if we look at Calipari now, and this is all I'll say when we'll be done, out of the tournament last year, out of the NIT tournament in the first round to Robert Morris last year, they are probably, I mean, they're really struggling this year. They look really bad. And, you know, the couple of years before that, they didn't do too hot either. They were early outs in the tournament. They had the Anthony Davis year, and that was kind of, that might be the anomaly more than it is the regularity. Well, Programs in college have their ups and downs. Yeah. They do. Yeah, no doubt. So he's won a title. They've had a lot of success. It's really tough to blame a program because everybody's got the ups and downs. Yeah, that's true. I think you're just, you're I, just upset. Yeah, I just, you know, I feel good to get that off my shoulders. Let's have a little bit of fun, Doug. Okay. Now, Trevor Booker, he is the Wizards forward. Yeah. Um, he recently, uh, there was an interview of him talking about how much he enjoys breakfast cereal. Yes, as we all do. I love it. It's great. Delicious. Yeah, and he says that he has usually eats two to three bowls a day and up to 21 <laughs> bowls a week. That's a lot. That's a lot of cereal. Yeah. I love my breakfast cereal. I, how many do you think you have? I probably have I probably have six bowls a week. That's a lot, too. I probably, I probably go three, four. I like to mix it up. Yeah, sometimes I go a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Like, you know, sometimes it might not have any in a week. But I guess he is considered to be 
a serial expert. He's a serial, serial expert. Yes. <laughs> I don't think that makes sense. I but mean, I got thinking about connoisseur, it. Connoisseur, perhaps. But I got thinking about uh, about this, um, and I I wanted to look up the top 10 most popular cereals of all time. Okay. Now, my favorite cereals are something completely different. What's your favorite, by the way? My favorite is Fruity Pebbles. Fruity Pebbles. I do <laughs> love Fruity Pebbles. I ride or die with Fruity Pebbles. God, it's such a great choice. It's I love so, that one. I think it's pretty underrated. Yeah, that's a good one. Mine's Reese's Puffs. <laughs> yeah, I, I I never eat it. You never eat it. I usually don't because it's it too is, good. Kinda. I mean, it's too good. It's just so freaking sugary, and it's you know it, you get like a a tiny little bit for what like seven or eight bucks. It's just it's a horrible deal. But every once in a while, when I get treat to a <laughs> to a bowl of Reese's Puffs, man, I am so freaking pumped. But anyways, I looked up the ten most uh, most purchased cereals of the 2013 year and i want to go down the list okay what, what, what do you think let's what, what do you think of the top three cheerios special k frosted mini wheats go go for it you you got three of the top 10 okay um rice krispies no fuck uh fruit loops yep frosted flakes yes uh that's all i got Come, all right oh. number, number uh Raisin Bran. Yes. Number 10, Raisin Bran. Okay. Number nine, Fruit Loops. Eight, Lucky Charms. Ah. Uh, Seven, Frosted Mini Wheats. Oh, yeah. Uh, six, I, Special K. Who's buying... Sp is Special K... Is that what, what girls buy or women? Well, like, what I is think that? it is a like a healthy cereal. Yeah, it's so f boring. <laughs> it is just flakes. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Oh. Yeah, that's a good cereal. Yeah. Number four, Cheerios. Okay. Uh, three, Honey Bunches of Oats. Probably... That is like the second tastiest cereal. Honey Bunches of Oats that is, is hard. That cereal is real hard. Dope. Yeah. Number two, Frosted Flakes. And number one, uh, Honey Nut Cheerios oh, making Cheerios. $555.8 million last year. Damn. People love the Honey Nut Cheerios. That is a hell of a cereal. See, I'm not a big Honey Nut Cheerios guy. What? Yeah, I think it's a little bland. I do like Fruity Pebbles, but uh, I, I'd have to say... See, Fruity Pebbles should be on that list, just from a taste. I guess the reason it's not on that list is because you eat it, if you eat a bowl of that for breakfast for more than like three consecutive days, you feel like you have cancer. Yeah, but it's great. <laughs> yeah. I bet, it's like a, I bet it's like a Fruit Loop thing where they're all the same flavor. They're just colored differently. Did you know that? Yeah, I saw that stat. I didn't know that until this, that article came out or whatever it was not too long ago. Yeah, I never knew that. I assumed they taste different, and they all melded into one thing. But now that I think about it, I was I was lied to. Yeah, everything I know is lie. Can I do a dramatic reading of that interview with? Yeah, Trevor please Bolton? do. Uh, yeah, let's let, let's set this up a little bit. Uh, I don't have I don't have the on here. Oh, okay. We'll cut this out then. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but, but what he's referring to is Trevor Booker. Uh, he's the guy, the serial boy for the Wizards. It was he just a, he had a really unusual interview. You have to check it out. It was on Washington Post. Is that is that where it was? It was really kind of a weird interview where they were reading him all these serials of uh, what Deadspin thought were the best. And I just thought his I thought his responses were just hilarious. He was just so dismissive about all the serials on the list. There, there was bad. I don't know what Deadspin's doing. Yeah. It was it was a pretty ridiculous list. It was a horrible list. list. I think the first one was like cream of wheat. Yeah. That's like, like what, an oatmeal. I, I don't thought. even know what that is. Yeah. That's not that's not a good opener. No, it was You can't go you can't go cream of wheat. And then wheat there was one. one in there that I didn't I had never even heard of before. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll post that on the uh, on like the Facebook. Yeah, that page. might not be a bad idea. Get put that up on the Facebook page. It was, maybe it, it, yeah, it was. It was a funny argument because I probably would have responded the exact same <laughs> yeah. way. Just like, what you, is this? Just like, nope. There was Raisin one. Brand was in there. He did like that one. Yeah, but I'm sure he likes the good ones, man. You like, give me Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Give me Raisin Brand. Give me some Lucky Charms. You can take that Crispix out of here. Get it out of my gone. Face. Crispix, Crispix. Is I do what? like Crispix though. You do? Yeah, I, I like them, but it's not it's not as fun, man. When you're like, you're getting a bowl of cereal in the morning, you want yeah. those frosted flakes. Give me that, give me those uh, frosted mini wheats. You kind of want to feel like a little kid. I want some cocoa puffs, man. I don't want to get, <laughs> I don't want to get special K. Get that out, unless it's the horse tranquilizer, then I want it. What about corn flakes? Isn't that what special K is? Yeah, is corn flakes a thing? Yeah, that, no, it's that, not. But no. I, I like corn flakes. So maybe what we could do is we'll put his interview up on the Facebook page and then we'll do a poll, see what people's favorite series yeah, are. Yeah, we ought to do that. Yeah. That could be interesting. Yeah. I do love cereal. I'm getting really hungry now. Yeah. 
sounds good. Yeah. Straight to a bowl after this. Here's some interesting stuff as well. I want to talk a little uniforms, Doug. Yes. This is one thing that I'm extremely passionate about, I, I, uniforms. It's one of those things that I didn't think that I cared that much about, but I end up being very, very into uniforms. I weirdly care a lot about uniforms, too. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of stupid. Like I, I, th- <laughs> I honestly think that I would probably choose a college. Like if I, was a, if I was a college football player or if I was a college basketball player and I wasn't going to go to the school that I already went to and I was getting recruited... I honestly think uniforms could play a factor in which school I choose. It's it's possible. I think it could too for me. And you have to wear it every day. It's that true. Matters. And I think a lot of these kids choose the same ways, but as you know, I am the exact opposite. Okay, so want to go to Oregon for the uniforms, I would go to Alabama for the uniforms. You're a classic guy. I'm more of like a yeah. new wave guy. Like Penn State yeah, well, Penn State, are, Penn State's legit. Yeah, I would like to go to those programs with like I like those kind of classic uniforms. But yeah. anyways, the Buccaneers are now in the uh, in the uniform talk with their new uniforms, and of course they're horrible. <laughs> they They've got pretty- chrome face mask and a bigger uh, decal. I mean, they, they, they looks pretty silly. Now let me let me ask you this: Is Nike like kind of genius because they're carrying on the tradition of horrific Bucks uniforms? Like, if the Bucks had a good uniform, would that not be true to who the Bucks are? I think their old ones were good. They just had a bad color. Well, that's kind of a big part of a uniform, though. Yeah, but I, but I, I actually personally liked the color. I think everyone hated the color, but I, I hated the, the color. I thought yeah. the scheme was good. I liked the, the, the emblem with the guy with the mustache. You so, oh, so you, you're talking about the creamsicle ones, the orange ones. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, the ones now suck, and the ones that they're going to get suck. Yeah. But I'm talking about the old, you know, the ones that everyone hated the most. I liked those. Because <laughs> to me, it's almost like Nike made the best uniforms possible by making a Buccaneer uniform that everybody would look at and be like, that's, that is awful looking. 64% of people voted on TampaBay.com. The, the, they had a poll and one of the options was yuck. And 64% <laughs> said yuck of their fan base. So at least it's not the people in Tampa. They understand what a good uniform is and they realize that they don't have it. You'll have to take a look at those things. You can just Google those. They, uh, but basically they have these weird like alarm clock numbers. Yeah, and, and they the do. Colors, like, yeah, they do have like that digital thing. They went with like that. Like it almost looks like, see, I like Oregon uniforms and I know you don't, but I feel like those are so original that they look cutting edge. Like they look like uniforms people will wear in the future. And I like that. You know, that has a cool edge to me. These look like a weird, like amalgam of like, tr- like kind of trendy things that were put together in a weird way. Like it almost looks like it's it's not original enough to be like uniquely weird. So it's just like this bad mesh of like kind of new and kind of old and kind of classic and kind of retro. It's just like a mess. Professional athletics really don't have any place for uniforms. I mean, let me rephrase that. Professional athletics have no incentive to get really hip with uniforms. See, but isn't... You because aren't... in college, you, you would say that your uniform kind of attracts the kids to go there. But as professionals, you're picking them. They just come to you no matter what. But you want people to buy the jerseys. That's a big revenue stream. I guess that's a good point. Like, I should have thought of that. That's <laughs> dumb. How did I not see that? Well, I mean, I get what you're saying, though. I mean, it's like, you know, I guess... Maybe you do research about it. I think most people like old, like the, right? Don't people like older looking uniforms? I mean, or maybe, maybe it's just because I'm me. So I think everyone is geared the exact same way as me. But for some reason, I just feel like the older uniforms appear to be more received. They received more, more well, received (laughs) better than, than new hip uniforms. Yeah. I think people like the throwbacks. Yeah. That's how it seems to be popular. Like a new wave, like the classic kind of re, re like reappropriating the classic ones. Yeah, I'm into that. Seattle sucks. I hate those uniforms. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not a huge fan of those either. But uh, I do tend to like some of the newer ones in the NFL. I really like the Titans. The, you're like the only person that likes the Titans uniforms. I just like I them. Of. I don't know why. And then I really like, um, especially when they came out. They're a little, they're a little passe now because they've been they've had those for like ten years. But like, and then I, I really liked. Uh, um, I like the, the as a classic. I like the Giants. I think that's my classic squad. Uh, interesting. The, the, you are incorrect. The correct answer is the <laughs> Buffalo Bills, all whites. Those are sick. Yeah, those are good. Anyways, enough of that. What's your favorite all time? Of like all uniforms, like any ever? uniform. Yeah. Do you have one? Oh man, I guess I hadn't thought of that. 
can I does it does a fit count? Because it's not necessarily the uniform of a specific team. I just like the way old basketball uniforms fit. Can I say that? Yeah. You like the short like, shorts? Yeah, the ABA, those look awesome. <laughs> yeah. Those are cool uniforms. Like, I, I wish that NBA returned to that fit. They might soon. Like the short shorts and like the super tight like wife beater tank tops. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be tight. Uh, my favorite, I think my, that's good you said that because I think my favorite uniform of all time is like 60s like Bill Walton blazers. Yeah. I'm all about the trailblazers, Unis. Yeah, those are cool. From back in the day. Speaking of NBA uniforms, a lot going on here with these NBA t-shirts. Yeah. Now, I think it... Uh, uh, at first sight, I think we most people are kind of just passing it off as something that they think is kind of trendy and cool. But do you think that there's an undertone going on here of 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 the higher ups, the suits wanting to go to t-shirts? That's why we keep seeing these things more and more. I think it's kind of what we were saying earlier. I think if you have a, another style of jersey, that's just one more thing people are going to buy. I also think that fans are more likely to buy a sleeved jersey. I don't like you know, I don't really. I I would want to wear a jersey to a game for a basketball game, but I don't want to wear a sleeveless jersey. Like that's always the conundrum yeah, when you yeah, go to that's an NBA you can game. Buy t-shirts. Yeah, I'm just saying some people like to wear a jersey. Like I would like to wear a Mavs jersey, like a throwback. You Mavs. would. Yeah, but the problem with the jersey. Wait is a minute, you, never you know. wear a jersey? Isn't that for like twelve year olds <laughs> and guys that like pour beer on people at the games? I mean, I don't know. I would like to wear one every once in a while. Mm. I think they're kind of cool. What, what's the? I feel like there's an etiquette of of adults and jerseys. There's there's a correlation here that we got to settle. Maybe I mean it's. I would never wear a football jersey ever. That looks ridiculous mm. to me. I think an NBA jersey you can pull off. It's the right style. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm a well, little maybe. <laughs> concerned right now. <laughs> all right, all right. I can see that. I Anyways, mean, back to the point. I, you you think it's just for revenue? You don't think it has anything to do with? I think it tattoos is. or no, anything like that. Okay. I don't think like yeah. for me, it's like I think okay. Regardless of what like the etiquette of wearing a jersey is, there are people who want to wear jerseys because yeah, the players hate these. Yeah, they hate them to death. They do. And LeBron said so. He said he felt he like said he was, this much. Quote after he lost to the Spurs, yeah. which I love this. I, I love I love the first part of this quote. Quote: I'm not making excuses, but I'm not a big fan of the jerseys. Yeah. So he. Just said, I'm not making excuses, and then he proceeds to make an excuse. Yeah, but here's an excuse. And now I'm going to make an excuse that the jerseys is what lost us the game as opposed to the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, every time I shoot, it feels like I'm just pulling right up underneath my arm. I really don't have much room for error on my jump shot. It's definitely not a good thing. Yeah, and I think a lot of them feel that way. I don't I don't like playing with sleeves. I mean, particularly, I think it's ridiculous for me to go to rec, like a rec league game and wear like a sleeveless thing because it just looks silly to me. So I usually wear sleeves, but I prefer to shoot sleeveless. I mean, I think most, almost everybody does. It's like a free, your arms are free. See, I am really bad at basketball, <laughs> but I always played with a t-shirt because I felt weird with the jerseys. Yeah. Like with just a jersey on, like that felt weird to me. Like yeah. I put the t-shirt on underneath. Dude, if you look, if you come out with like a jersey to like a rec game and like you, you come out with like a jersey and like nice shoes, you just look like such a clown. Yeah. You look like you're taking it away. Well, I'm talking about when I played on a team. It's like, no, no, I, yeah. Oh, you wore a t-shirt under. Yeah, I wore, no, I wore a t-shirt under the jersey oh. like while I was playing in high school. Okay. All right. But I mean, I was horrible, so it's not like I've got You weren't doing trick. a lot of shooting. Well, I was doing a lot of shooting. I was doing a lot of missing. Oh, a lot of bricking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so regardless of whatever the, the uniforms are for, like, I think people want to wear jerseys and they would maybe prefer something with sleeves. So I think that's what it's aimed at. That's I what hope, I would say. I hope that's the case. Because you never know what to wear under a, a sleeveless jersey. Are you like, do you wear a t-shirt? Do you wear like a... Some people do that thing where they wear like a collared shirt, like a, like a dress shirt, and then they put the jersey over it. Like that looks ridiculous. There's no good way to wear a basketball jersey. This has nothing to do with this at all, okay. but I just thought of something that I hate. Okay. And that I'm getting really tired of the NBA playoffs when they do the... They have the color-coordinated crowd. Oh, I hate that That's too. so effective like once. I think you get one a year. Yeah. And then that's it. But every freaking game of the playoffs is so annoying. Well, because everybody does it now. It's not spontaneous. It, they give you the shirts. Yes. It's such a sellout thing to do. Like, I was embarrassed Like when the Mavs started doing it. It's like anything that the Miami Heat fans start should never be replicated ever. 
Like that, the fact that they were the first ones to do it should tell you that it's a terrible idea and no one should ever do it ever. They're not exactly the model franchise as you saw in game six. <laughs> as they left in as they mass all exodus. Left. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that right there tells you everything you need. Well, to you might be right. I was just, uh, that, that was something that was kind of concerning me. I kept seeing these t shirts today and like today with the, the Lakers and the Thunder. Although the Thunder were wearing their regular uniforms, they had the Los Lakers sleeved jerseys. Yeah, that's another thing. It's just another revenue stream. Yeah, well, if that's, I think I would be more okay with that. I just was thinking hmm, maybe we're going to transition into sleeved jerseys. Now, I don't really personally have any problem with the sleeved jerseys, but. Yeah. Well, if the players hate them, I don't think it'll happen because that's ultimately the most important thing. I, I Have you heard about this news? Phil Jackson is in the news uh, about possibly coming back to coach. Hmm. Um, Phil Jackson he is 68 years old and he's already turned down an opportunity to be the New York Knicks head coach. I guess they've been talking. Okay. This is what Stephen A. Smith reported. So are you telling me Mike Woodson's not coming back? Because that would be shocking. Yeah, it's not looking good. He's 17 under, <laughs> games under 500 right now. And they're the a Knicks walking really disaster. Suck. Um, the Knicks uh, apparently have not stopped trying to get Phil Jackson, of course. Uh huh. Um, Probably smart. They're talking about uh, a high-ranking office job possibly for him. Now, he has said, Phil Jackson has said that he would continue coaching for a short time, essentially to lay groundwork for another coach to uh, build on the foundation. That's okay, so he'd kind of Primarily do like- what he would... I think, I think you'd prefer... Uh, an office job, but I think if somebody offered him a head coaching job, he probably would take it. If so he knew it would segue in that way. So he'd do the kind of Pat Riley thing where he's the front head office guy, the president, and then he's coaching for a little while and then he heads, hands it over to his protege, which would be like a spolstra. I presume that is exactly okay. the situation. Well, they need something. I, like he would be dumb to take the coaching job if he didn't have control over personnel because that team is just the most horrifically run. It, I mean, they make the Cowboys look like. They make Jerry Jones. James Dolan makes Jerry Jones look like a genius. Well, the fact that they haven't won much lately, I can't imagine Phil Jackson would go in anywhere where he doesn't have control. There's no way he's going to take a job that he really isn't that excited about. Yeah. He's Phil freaking Jackson. He's won 11 titles. You listen to what he has to say when he comes in. Yeah. So he's going to do what he wants to do, and he's not about ready to take something. Yeah, just some ridiculous job. Just some random job. I mean, to be fair, he did start his career with the Knicks, and he's always said it would be nice to end in New York. So, I mean, maybe there's some chance that just for, like, you know, the purposes of making his career, like, you know, starting in in the same place, he would take a job he didn't really want. But that doesn't seem like him. It seems like a waste of his time. Yeah, he wouldn't do that. I don't know. I don't know how he would do it. I mean, has, he's never really done any sort of personnel things. Like, he's never done a front office job. So, I'd be interested to see well, how that Well, I'm sure out. he could figure it out. I mean, he's <laughs> yeah. been around long enough to know some talent. I yeah. think that he... I can't imagine that'd be too tough for him. Yeah. I mean, you're probably right. I mean, I... I, I I just wonder James Dolan is such a like a like a little kind of just spoiled little kind of brat like you know he's like the typical trust fund kid who doesn't really know anything got the team handed to him and he thinks he knows more than he does and so I wonder how much they would butt heads and how how much James Dolan would actually allow somebody to run the team well at some point you've got to just throw your hands up and say I give up you would think so we've been trying and we're 17 games under 500 and We've got all these players, but it doesn't seem to be working. And if there's one thing Phil Jackson can do, it's get egos to coexist. Yeah. But I don't think that's necessarily their problem. I think their problem is they don't have any good players. They have yeah. Carmelo and well, a bunch of scrubs. Issue. And then Tyson Chandler's good, but he's getting older. I mean, like, I, I just don't know about James Dolan. And, and he's going to need to secede control over to someone totally if they want to be good. This is the same guy who was talking about hiring Isaiah Thomas again, like last week. Which is just like that. The fact that you would even say that sentence out loud and not whisper it in your darkest, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in your darkest dreams only and keep it to yourself. Like the fact that you would even say that to people uh, makes me think that he just has no idea what the, the Knicks are a mess. Like. And it's kind of funny. It is kind of, funny. I, I really don't like New York that much. So it's not that bad <laughs> to, that they have him. but I, I just am glad. I just don't want Phil Jackson back with the Lakers. Cause I definitely don't want them to be good. Yeah. I think it would probably be better for basketball if the Knicks were good though. Yeah, I think like, too, as okay. just a fan of the NBA, I think like it's if, cool. if the Knicks were good, I think it would get everybody kind of pumped up. I, think, I agree. I think I'd probably get into it too. I don't. I guess I don't really hate the Knicks, but I just don't like New York. Having having awesome games though in MSG is always a plus. It's just a great. It's like the best venue for basketball. I mean, period. So if you have playoff games and big games happening there, bonus. Yeah, I think you're right. Phil Jackson is 1,155 and 485 in 10 seasons of being a head coach. Eh. 
in the NBA. That's okay, I guess. That's pretty good. And eleven <laughs> and eleven rings. He's got to he's got to fit him on his toes now. Plus two as a player. Thirteen. Yeah. There you go. Sick. You can't call him a loser. Say That's that much. Quite a lot. Got a segment here, Doug. All right. We're going to start this brand new segment. It was brought to our attention not too long ago from mm-hmm. one of our uh, friends listening to the podcast that I say the word whack quite a bit. Maybe. Doug uses the word butthurt quite a bit. I, I'm having a love affair with, with butthurt. Yeah. Butthurt is funny. Once something seeps into your vo- vocabulary, I feel like it's hard to get rid of for a yeah, little while. Butthurt. When you're excited about yeah. it. It's good. I feel like it's a good word. But because of this, we decided to do to make fun of ourselves a little bit and create a segment called Whack or Butthurt. Okay. What this segment is going to be is we're going to take, there will most likely be a player or a organization or somebody who is crying, complaining, kind of throwing a hissy, so mm-hmm. to speak. And we are going to determine whether this, per, like what, what this, the, the entity, person, franchise did to this player or player did to this player was whack, or is this guy who's talking just butthurt? Okay, I like that, and that's what we're gonna we're <laughs> gonna try to do. We'll, this is the first time, so we don't have any cool intro music or anything uh, spiffy about it. But just know that we're now playing whack or butthurt. <laughs> and first on this segment is our second baseman from the Detroit Tigers, Ian Kinsler. Yeah, Ian Kinsler was in the news recently. He did an interview with ESPN, um, the magazine. And he was quoted in saying uh, he called his GM a sleazeball, that is John Daniels, of the Texas Rangers. He got yeah. traded from the Texas Rangers in November. And he says that he hopes the Rangers go 0 and 162. He blames John Daniels as being the reason they got rid of Nolan Ryan as, mm-hmm. uh, as the CEO of the team. President, uh, yeah. And, and, and that's what he said, which has caught a, a little bit of a controversy. So we've went back and kind of looked at this situation, and... And I wanted to ask you, Doug, is what the Rangers did to Ian Kinsler by trading him and, and, and by him finding out from a text from a radio host that he got traded. Yeah. And by the Rangers firing, getting rid of some of their talent that got him to those back-to-back World Series games. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that whack or is Ian Kinsler just butthurt? <laughs> okay. I will say after reading all this stuff and just being a Rangers fan in general, like kind of keeping up with the team, uh, that Ian Kinsler is butthurt. And that's not, I'm not just saying that because that's my word. I, I genu- genuinely feel he's butthurt because he, um, the Rangers are a shrewd organization. And whether you like it or not, they are never afraid to cut ties with somebody, even if that person has a good track record with the team, if they think it's the right move. And I think that kind of ruffles some feathers. And I think that's why you've seen a history. I mean, John Daniels, from what I read, is not exactly the, uh, you know, a poet with words. He's not, he's not going to make it flowery for you. He's not exactly the most, you know, he's not going to pat you on the back and whisper sweet nothings in your ear to make you feel better about it. So that probably doesn't hurt. I mean, doesn't help. But uh, I think that they saw an opportunity. They had to increase their power and they made a shrewd decision and got rid of a guy that a lot of people liked. And... Ian Kinsler really liked being in Texas, and because of that, he got a little butthurt and wished hateful things on his old team. I think it's good that we have a little bit of this stuff in the news. I think yeah. it's kind of fun to stir some things up, maybe get a rivalry uh, uh, of these teams. That's always fun. But I agree with you. These teams are running a business, and you know, although it might not be the best business practice to take the talent, you know, to take your product. Mm-hmm. And treat them kind of harshly, yeah. Um, or firing one of the most beloved people of all time. Well, uh, he wasn't fired; he was kind of forced out. Okay, but yeah, that's not great. You know, it, it, by doing by forcing out, you know, a, a, such a beloved player. If that's if that is the case, I mean, we don't really know. That's this is what Ian Kinsler speculates. Um, you know, those necessarily aren't reflective good business practices don't those don't reflect on good franchises but at the same time they were in the playoffs last year they have been to back-to-back world series this team has had a lot of success and you can't hardly argue with results yeah and their farm system's really good and they've done a good job of maintaining a competitive team while also building a farm system which is a hard thing to do and we we talk about this all the time and winning covers up blemishes yeah we, we right now with uh jim harbaugh 
you know, in the 49ers that they, they've kind of had a couple of people Tiffs. have been speculating that maybe Harbaugh's a little too much for everybody. Yeah. But because they're winning, everything's covered up. If this was a story at all and they were not winning games, he'd be fired. Yeah. Or they would have just traded him. But when you win, people put up with things. And so if this GM is is, is as much of the boogeyman as Ian Kinsler says that he is, it's covered up as long as they keep putting results. So let's let me ask you this. What do you like? How do you feel about this? What is the line between being just a good person and doing what, like being a good business? Well, I think being a good person makes business better. I think if Be- you there's there's almost no ethics when you're running a business. Mm-hmm. You can pretty much do anything, but by doing by participating in bad business practice, by being you know uh, a sleazeball quote. Mm-hmm. That's usually going to reflect negatively on you, so you'd want to avoid that. Yeah. Do you think that teams owe loyalty to the players? No, I really don't. They pay them the salary. They are, and and that's kind of why I don't really sympathize with Ian Kinsler here. Yeah, it'd be nice to get a nice for courtesy phone call, but they don't require that. This is a business, and you are a part of it. Mm-hmm. And you need to understand that not everybody's here to be buddies. They're there to make money. And you provide a service that they need, being the baseball player. Mm -hmm. And when you are either not providing or something like that, they will cut you. Yeah. I mean, they pay you good money when you're there. So, yeah, it'd be nice if, if if the front office was running the business the way it's supposed to be, but that's not a requirement. Yeah. Now, at the same time, you, as a business person, you would want to treat your players with respect, but it's not a requirement. To be fair, what I heard happened is that John Daniels was on a plane while the story leaked. And so he couldn't make the phone call, but he sent an email to uh, the assistant GM to co- make a phone call. Oh, but it's so like, nice. <laughs> so, so nice of him. Not ideal, but uh, you know, maybe maybe not as bad as, as as Ian Kinsler felt it was when it happened, because obviously you don't want to find out in the news that you've been traded. Um, but I, I'm I'm so conflicted on this because you know you do want your team to be the best it can possibly be, and you do want your team to make smart decisions. At the same time, like. It, these are people and I feel like if somebody does a good job for you that maybe it's not always the right thing to get rid of them just because you can get something better they did get Prince Fielder out of the deal yeah out of the trade which is probably for the best it sounds like Ian Kinsler was butthurt so he <laughs> needed to be you know it's it's good for everybody I think I think ultimately we're, everyone's squared away and happy yeah so that's two we have two, we're two butthurts on that two butthurts on the initial Wacker butt I, hurt. I agree. The, the initial Wacker butt hurt, two butt hurts. This isn't part of the Wacker butt hurt game, but it's a little bit baseball news and someone okay. with a little bit of an attitude. Okay. Recently, Albert Pujols has been in the news. Early in uh, spring training, uh, Jesse Spector of the Sporting News asked Albert Pujols a few questions, um, generally about whether or not Pujols might rebound well enough, in, rebound well enough <laughs> in 2014 so he could put up, quote, trout-like numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, this set off um, Pujols, who was talked about it a little bit later when he was speaking with Bob Nightingale of USA Today. This is the quote Albert Pujols said, uh, talking about the reporter who asked him about if he could put up trout-like numbers again because, of course, Pujols' numbers have been down from his standards. Yeah. Quote, can, can you imagine someone saying that to me? I felt like saying, come on now. Are you serious? Are you really asking me that? Check out my numbers. I know what Mike Trout has done in his first two years, and it's pretty special. But but will you look at my numbers? I've been doing this for almost 14 years. The only guy in baseball who can match my numbers that I've put up is Barry Bonds, and someone is actually asking if I can put up numbers like Mike Trout. Are you freaking kidding me? Hmm. He seems happy. A little My first thought here was I don't know why he's so sensitive. And my point of bringing this article up is that I've, got, I've recently decided that I, I kind of dislike when players comment on their own legacy. I'm using air quotes. Okay. I don't understand why players feel that it's their responsibility to remind us how good they are. If there's one thing they do not need to do, it's talk to sports people of whether or not we think that they're any good or not. Hmm. Sports media spends their whole entire existence <laughs> crunching numbers and debating who's better than who. And believe me, Albert Pujols, we have not forgotten what you've done. Yeah, He's had a remarkable career. 
Yeah, he's all, he was awesome. He's a career 320, 321 hitter. He's, I mean, 14 years. At the same time. Playing in this, I mean, hitting about 30 home runs a year. I mean, the guy is insane. Yeah. We haven't not forgotten. And although I do think it is a little silly saying, like, hey, put up Trout numbers. That, that's kind of a silly question. But at the same time, like, why don't you just dismiss it? Because we can all think for ourselves, and we all know that, yeah, you've had a better you know, couple, first couple of years than Trout. A little context on this. The question came up because Trout's going to bat second, and Pujols is going to bat third still. And... <clears throat> That still, me, se- that still seems appropriate. Yeah, to me, that seems like a valid question. Like, are you going to be able to put up the numbers that somebody else would be able to put up in this third spot? And I think I think Pujols has been really sensitive about the fact that he took this big contract and he has not lived up to it all. And I think he's a little sensitive about the fact that he might be in decline, which is a hard thing for any athlete to deal with. So, I mean, I think on some level, it's like, dude, Albert, come on. You make like $25 million a year, you know, like you – people expect things of you. I mean, you can't just take that money and then expect everyone to give you a pass. I mean, it's just like, dude, you got to be real, a little bit real about this. Like you did those things. Like you haven't done those, those numbers that you're talking about for like two years now. You've had two back-to-back bad seasons and you always swear it'll be fine. But at a certain point for every athlete, it's not fine anymore. You lose it and it's over. People are freaking out. 25 million or 23. He's going to be getting 23. It's a backloaded contract. He gains a million every single year from now until 2021 where he'll get 30 million as a 41 year old. Yeah, that's crazy. Why do, why do teams do that? Why Backload do, contracts? Yeah. That seems so maybe, dumb. Maybe for inflation? Maybe. I, like, it, it just seems like you would want to have the most money you're giving a player be early on the contract where you know he's going to be the best. Like it would make it would be more like acceptable to give him 41 million like the first year of that contract and be like, well, okay. I mean 30 million at the first part of that contract as opposed to like having him be 41 years old when he would probably be hitting 165 and like, you know, like, we're paying this guy 30 million dollars. Yeah, it just looks bad, I don't know. I've looked at the numbers here at Trout and Pools and their first two years are about identical. Pools was a 321 hitter, Trout's a 324 hitter. Yeah. I mean, they've had about the same amount of plate appearances in two years, in the first two years of playing. I mean, they're, they're both great. And I just, the whole point of this was that I was upset about is you don't, I hate when players talk about their legacy for some reason. That's, that's recently kind of ch- like bothering me. I, yeah. don't li- I don't need you to tell me how good you are because I do all the research myself. <laughs> like, it's, we don't forget anything. Yeah, I agree. And, I guess he thinks he, I mean, yeah. He, and we all can tell that it's like, yeah, Trout's had a better better year than Pujols for two years, but you're, but Pujols is right. He has had, he put up insane numbers for 11 of 13 years. Yeah. Insane. Sure. Yeah. What Trout's been doing the past two years, Pujols did that even at a higher level than that for like four or five years. He bet at 359 in like 2007. I don't have it in front of me, but I saw he, one of his years was a 359 batting average. Yeah. I mean, he was the yeah, best player for ridiculous. a long time. But, I mean, I, I think... 49 you know, homers. Again, the context of the whole thing is legit. It's a legit question. And, like you said, there's no reason to jump into your legacy. You don't have to jump into your legacy every time someone asks you a relevant qu- question about the team now. We're talking about the Angels right now. Yeah, just say... I will. Yeah. I, I, and I love players who handle the media appropriately. The appropriate response for Albert Pujols would have been, you know, having, like, I, I, I'm working hard to, to be the best that I can. Because that's... Even though it's so boring hearing athletes say the right thing, it's almost just like a check. The media is there to ask you questions to see if you're not a psychopath. <laughs> and then when you go off like Mike Gundy, then it's, you know, everything. Th- then it's off. like, okay, yeah, you're crazy. Yeah. That's not the right answer. Like, you know, there is a right answer for these questions. And this was, in my opinion, the wrong answer. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, if you're talking ideally just for the functioning of a team and a team unit, being boring is the right way to yes. be because it doesn't cause any drama. And here with this weird answer that he's giving, he's causing a rift between him and Mike Trout. Like, exactly. it's like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. And cause he's on your team. It's not like yeah, he's, he's retired. Like, you know, you're, pl- you're talking about the guy who's going to be, you know, playing left field for you or c- does he play center? I think he plays center. Trumbo played left. Yeah. Okay. Trout plays center. Okay. Yeah. And the guy's batting, you know, right. You're right behind him in the lineup and you've kind of got this. Now there's this thing that everyone sees, even if they're good, even if they're boys, you know, now he's just saying that you're, you know, it's, it's silly and it could have been avoided. Yeah. And I'm also overly sensitive. <laughs> how, how are we doing on time, Doug? Have we got time for, uh, for another article or should we get into the other segment? Yeah, we can do one more. One more, one more uh, news story? Yeah. I thought this story was kind of interesting. 
There's not much to it, but Rashard Mendenhall is retiring at age of 26. Now, Rashard Mendenhall hasn't been exactly the league's best back, but he did rush for 687 yards on 217 carries, both team high team highs Mm -hmm. for the Pittsburgh Steelers last year. He is 26 years old and is now going to retire from playing in the NFL. Uh, In February 25th, in a column he wrote for the Huffington Post, he says, as I write this today, today is the, or excuse me, as I write this, today is the day the journey is over and I am fully at peace, eagerly looking to a new way which lies ahead. Uh, Rashard Mendenhall is now going to retire. He wants to write books and uh, travel the world. Okay. I wonder if this is a way of him sugarcoating the fact that nobody wanted to 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 put put them on the team, put it, put him on their team. It's it's possible. You you you'd think that being the the best back for the Pittsburgh Steelers would at least you would get a job. It's not that no one would hire him. I mean, yeah, he wasn't the best back in the world, but maybe he doesn't want to be a backup, and so he has, there's no options for him. But here's my thing, like. And maybe I, he just wants to write books. I, it's, it's just a story you do not hear every day. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe he is story. worried about all this like CTE stuff. And if his, if his mind is going to be important to him later in life, he doesn't want to like, you know, gr- like grind out, like, a, no, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, run his, me. run his brain into the ground, like on some mediocre team getting like, you know, you know, fit 500 yards a season. Like that maybe doesn't seem worth it to him. I don't blame him for what he's doing. And it, it's almost like we can't even speculate, man. If the dude wants to go write in books and travel the world, like that sounds fun to me. Yeah, no, it does. I'd like to do that, and if I had that money, you know, I'd probably do it too. It's I'm not blaming him. It's just, it's just a jarring story to read. I mean, to me, the thing is, what's weird is like your your athletic prowess is so fleeting in the scheme of your life. It's such yeah. a small window of time where you get to experience being an athlete. And I never understood guys who just dropped out early to go do something that they could do for the next 60 years of their life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what's that saying? Make hay when it's raining or what are <laughs> the No, make hay when the sun's shining. Yeah. Maybe something like that. There's a saying about that. Yeah. It's like, you've got, you know, yeah, you, you most likely want to hold off for about five more years. That's about how long realistically running backs have got. I mean, that's even pushing it. Mm-hmm. Say he goes, so he's 31 years old, then retire. And yeah. then you've made five more years of salary and you're just that much better off. Yeah. I, because it was like, uh, remember Robert Smith for the Vikings? He was also a running back. He dipped out early, and he was like, you know what? I uh, I want to become a doctor, and it's like that's cool. I mean, the awesome. That's like a really awesome thing to to, to do after you're you know in the NFL. But like, one, he didn't even do that, and two, it's like, you know, he just ended up becoming a broadcaster for a sport he could have still been playing. It's like, I, I just don't understand why you, you give that up. Maybe the, maybe it is the toll it takes on your body, and they know more about their own bodies and what they want to feel like when they're 60 than I do. Because being running back is a brutal fucking position, and you're going to have some problems if you play that for long enough. Yeah, and if you don't want to play, if your head's not in it, don't play. Like, that's, yeah. That's fine with me. But it was the same thing with Ricky Williams when he just dipped out for a couple years to like smoke pot. It's just like, dude, you have the rest of your life to smoke pot. Like, Do this now while you can. Like, You're going to regret it. I feel like when you don't do something... And then it goes away, and you can, and and you lose the chance, and you'll never be able to do it again. That's stuff you end up regretting in life. So I just feel bad. I mean, but hopefully he doesn't feel that way. Well, I, I, it, it doesn't sound like it. Props man. to him, though. Hey, man, yeah, do your thing. Like it's, I never knew Richard Minhall was such an eloquent gentleman. I guess I didn't either. But he's yeah. very distinguished. <laughs> he is, I suppose. But he's fancy. Yeah, it sounds with, like fun, man. I'd, rather, I'd, I'd probably rather travel the world and write books rather than be an NFL running back too. I mean, I think I would too. I don't know how much money. Mainly because I would be a terrible NFL running back. And yeah, I would probably have a spinal bad. injury by very now. Very painful. Yeah. Certainly wouldn't. I don't think I would excel. Yeah, it wouldn't be that much Based fun. on our 40 times last week, I think that's oh, clear. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I felt so much better towards the end of that podcast. I know. I could, you, 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 could, you were coming on. I, oh, man. I started out. I thought I was going to pass out walking in, <laughs> walking in, walking into the building yesterday after we ran the 40s last week. And one more segment. Let's do it. Here's the, new, here's the news. We're going to play some music for this. Yes, we are. This particular segment is... Uh, I, I, I thought it was so fun to read the paper last time. <laughs> but my hometown paper... Let me set this up. My hometown paper is called the Minneapolis Messenger. That's the, that's the name of my paper. But within this paper, some of the news is kind of legit. I mean, it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a small paper. comes out weekly. But within this newspaper, there's a segment that is written um, by just some locals in the town about kind of updating people on what they're doing. They, they, these are country folk who kind of live out there, and uh, and it kind of is 
the Salt Creek is kind of this little area just outside of my town. So they okay. have this part area called the Salt Creek News. So I get the paper. Uh, it's supposed to be every week, but it doesn't always come in that way. So this week I got my paper a little bit late. That's why we did not do this segment last week. But there is, of course, a Salt Creek News segment in the paper today. I had it. And here it is. All right. It's a small area. Do you know who writes this? Yes, I will. Uh, Mary Lott. Okay. Do you know who that is? Yes, I believe she was my teacher when I was just a little kid. I mean, she's an elderly woman, but how, she writes this. How old is she? Mm, I 80s? Say 70s. 70s, 80s. Okay. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. Cue the Does music. she do it like in her, in her kitchen? Maybe. Okay. I like that idea. <clears throat> here it is. Salt Creek News. Okay. From Minneapolis. On Valentine's Day, Al Michaels took Joan Miles to the movie Winter Tales in Salina. <laughs> oh, boy. Emer Emery and Carlene Berry went to the FFA Toy Show on Saturday. Carlene had her recital for her piano students Sunday afternoon in the Ottawa County Health Center. Mm -hmm. Sunday evening, they went to dinner and saw the movie Amazing Grace at the Community Bible Church. And that <laughs> is your Salt Creek News for the week, everybody. Hard-hitting news. Hard-hitting <laughs> Minneapolis, Edge. Kansas news with perspective. It's always good insight. to get. It's always good to get an update from back home, Doug. Yeah, it is. I mean, you. It's good to know what. See, you got a big paper seeing. though. What, what, what's the Dallas paper? Dallas Morning News. Dallas Morning News. Yeah. See, this still is, around, still alive and kicking. There it is. Newspapers are taking a big hit though in media. I think they're actually still maybe a little bit profitable. A lot of old people in Dallas who can't, you know, just stuck in their ways. No computers. It's keeping it. Yeah, it's, they're keeping it alive. There's a little bit of a size difference between your hometown paper and mine. Yeah, there's also about uh, 1.7 million more people in my town than yours. Yeah. Or maybe, no, 1.93 million. How many people are in Dallas? Two million. There's only... Th oh, is there 30,000 in yours or 3,000? 2,000. 2,000? Oh, okay. So, yeah. There's 1.98 million more people in Dallas. Yeah. So but that makes uh, a big. That makes a little bit of. There a it is. Keep it up. But see, I, I want to keep those names in your head because you're going to start recognizing some of the characters from that segment. I'm excited for the the uh, large web the community that it will be. Bible Church, the Golden Wheel Senior Center. Those are those are some of the hip places. It's going to become like a, like a Dickens novel at the end of each episode. I think it's good. It's you know because <laughs> that's what news stories do. They you know they end with like the kittens and puppies. But the Cooper and Rupert podcast, we end up with tales of a small town. I like it. That's it, man. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, well, yeah. next week we've got uh, th that's going to be the fun we're going to have with the brackets. Yes, uh, looking forward to selection that. Sunday will be next week, but we'll do the podcast later, so the brackets will be out. We'll get those filled out. We'll uh, we'll get our picks in for this week. Get Karen involved. Maybe a couple. Maybe other a people. couple other characters involved yeah. with the uh, the bracket challenge, and you know a lot going on this week with the conference tourneys. There's a lot of sports. Looking forward to it. I can't wait. Thank you for listening, and uh, we will see you again next week, everyone. Thanks, everyone.